invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 23. If you're using one of our Blue Pew Bibles, you'll find that on page 458. So this morning, we're beginning a new series um, that will take us up until about Christmas time. Uh, and we're going to be studying the life of David, uh, but we're not going to be doing it from First and Second Samuel. Rather, we'll be doing it from the book of Psalms. And we're going to track David's life chronologically uh, as we look at some of the Psalms that David wrote uh, in particular historical situations. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're beginning today with probably the most loved psalm of them all, uh, Psalm 23. Uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're taking this psalm to reflect on David's early life uh, as he was a shepherd boy, uh, before he killed Goliath, before he was anointed uh, to be king over Israel. Uh, he probably wrote this later in life, uh, but I uh, believe that it reflects the lessons that he learned while he was a shepherd uh, and the things that uh, he learned about God uh, during those same days. Uh, life was hard for David. When you, when you read First and Second Samuel, uh, there, there's just continued problems that he goes through. Uh, there is the, the years of running away because Saul... Uh, was seeking to kill him. Uh, there were the years of war in which he was constantly going to battle against his enemies. There, there were the years of suffering the consequences of, of his own sin uh, and Absalom and, and those kinds of events that came up. And yet through them all, David learned to trust the Lord. Uh, and this is a good psalm for us, not only for David, uh, but for us as well, because frankly, life is hard. Life is hard in this sinful world because we're sinful people. Uh, life is hard because we have disappointments. Uh, others disappoint us and crush us. We disappoint ourselves. We, we endure uh, health issues and financial issues and job issues. And, and we struggle in, the, in all of these things. And Psalm 23 is designed to provide us with that encouragement and that hope that it is the Lord who is present with us, and it is the Lord who always provides for us exactly what our needs are at every particular moment. Uh, this is a, a very familiar psalm, and uh, so I want to encourage you to pay careful attention as we read, even though you know what's coming next, uh, to hear the Word of God uh, and to reflect upon it. So let me read Psalm 23. This is the Word of God. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down on green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's come to pray. Father, we thank you for this inspired song uh, that you gave to David so that it could be passed on to us. And we thank you that this psalm, which in David's life had such great meaning, has had continued great meaning and application in the lives of your church through generation after generation. Fathers, we come to read something and to study something that is so familiar to us, uh, we pray that uh, you would give to us the ability to, to focus, that you would give to us the ability to learn, and that your Holy Spirit would come and apply these great truths to us so that we will leave knowing uh, what it means that you are our shepherd and to find comfort and encouragement in that. And we pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. 
So as I've already briefly said, the, the context and the background to uh, the psalm uh, is that I believe David wrote it later in his life. We don't know when exactly. Uh, there is no uh, part of the title is just who the author is, doesn't tell us when David wrote this psalm. But there's no doubt that he wrote it looking back and reflecting on what his experience had been uh, as a shepherd. Uh, we know from 1 Samuel uh, that he was the shepherd of his family's sheep, uh, and he experienced uh, all the things that went with shepherding. Uh, and he was the shepherd when he was a teenager. Uh, and uh, he was out in the field with the sheep and, and saw all that happened and was able to reflect later in life at least uh, on what it meant that the Lord was his shepherd and the Lord is indeed our shepherd as well. And the main theme of the entire psalm is what is found in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Part of the problem of, uh, and, I, and I use that word loosely, of, of growing up in Christian homes and going to Sunday school and, and spending all of our lives in church for some of us is there's radical statements made in Scripture that no longer shock. Uh, this was a shocking statement for David to make. The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, the word that's used there in the ESV, you'll notice they're all capital letters for Lord. It is that covenant name of God that he revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, uh, I am that I am. Uh, we're, we're talking about the God who is not bound by time or space, but, but is exalted over everything. The God who's infinite in power and showed his infinite power as he created the heavens and the earth and, and sustains them by the word of his power. Uh, we're, we're talking about a God who's exalted above all things that we know because he's not part of this material world. And to say, this God, this exalted and high God is my shepherd, is something that would have struck some as being blasphemy. This is something that sh he shouldn't be called a shepherd because in Israel, the shepherd was someone that was lowly, that wasn't well respected, that, that didn't have a, a lot of status. I tried to think how I might do it if I was doing it today, and I, and I might say, the Lord is the emptier of my bedpan. Like, what? You can't say that. That's the same kind of analogy that, that would have been thought of. The Lord who, was, who is exalted and high is the one who's lowly and does the things that nobody else wants to do. This God is the God who is the shepherd. Now, shepherding in David's day, uh, all the way up until the first century, uh, was uh, something that uh, was hard. It was a hard life. You may have romantic visions of David sitting out on a rock and playing his harp and the sheep all being harmonious and, and everything looking great, uh, and that happened in paintings. But the life of a shepherd was a hard life. They were with the sheep 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They lived outdoors. Uh, they traveled long distances to find pasture and to find water. Uh, I, I, I slightly changed the motto of the post office to describe them. Uh, they were with the sheep in snow or rain or heat or gloom of night. The shepherd couldn't say, ah, oh, it's raining today, I'm not going to go out. No, you were out and you were with the sheep. They were the ones who were there with the sheep every day. They were the ones who provided the care that needed to be done. And who would ever want to be a shepherd? Who would grow up thinking, oh, if only I could have that life? The Lord. The Lord was the one who said, I will be the shepherd of my sheep. I who am exalted and lifted up over all things, I will stoop to that which is looked at as being the, the lowest of opportunities. And I will take on that responsibility. I will shepherd my flock. And so he did. And he did it particularly in Christ. In John chapter 10, Jesus defines himself, as you remember, as the good shepherd. 
He says, I'm the shepherd who's come for my sheep. I'm the one who cares for my sheep and who loves them. I'm the one uh, who is almighty God and who has for all eternity shared equally in the glory of the Father. But I've humbled myself and taken on a human body to be the shepherd of my sheep. James Johnston, in his commentary on the Psalms, said Psalm 23 was written by David about Christ for Christians. This is a psalm that that draws our attention to Christ over and over again. Not just because John 10 tells us he's the good shepherd, but because he's the one who does these very things for us as people that we see in the Gospels and, and in life for us today. And because Christ is our shepherd, we can say with David, I shall not want. The word want doesn't have the idea of I get everything I want, but it's the idea of I have everything that I need. It's a picture of a flock of sheep who are content because all of their needs have been provided for them. And they're able to to rest, as we'll see in just a moment. And they're, they're able to experience peace and joy because they know the love of the shepherd. Calvin says, what greater example of Christ's love for us was there other than leaving eternal glory and coming to be the shepherd of his people? That same great love for, of Christ has for us is the love that causes him to provide everything that we need. Psalm 34, verse 9 says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. We know that. We've experienced that. And we've seen God's hand at work in our lives at, at times where we didn't know how he would do it, but he did. And he's a God to be praised. Now, the rest of the psalm is fleshing out verse 1. How does God provide for all the needs of his sheep? And there's four things that the psalm says God does as our shepherd that he does for us who are part of his flock. And the first one is there in verse 2. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides still waters. God gives us rest. Now the background to all four of these is the fact that sheep are some of the stupidest animals that have ever been upon the earth. They have absolutely no capacity to defend themselves. They wander away from the rest of the flock on a regular basis. They are unable to go and find water and to find pasture uh, when they need it, if they've left the flock. Uh, sheep, uh, one, I, I wish I could remember who said this. It was a while ago that I read it. And, and he said, the strongest argument against evolution is sheep. <laughs> sheep could never have survived the survival of the fittest uh, as that evolutionary process was going on. Uh, sheep are made to show us how dependent we are upon God. Because sheep will die apart from the work of their shepherd. Some people, I mentioned this last week, some Christians don't like being called sheep, especially when the pastor says they're one of the stupidest animals in the world. But it's entirely for that reason, I believe, that God uses the whole picture of the shepherd and the sheep. Because when we get over our pride and we recognize who we are according to Scripture, we see that we are entirely dependent upon God, just as sheep are to their shepherd. The shepherd is responsible, first of all, to see that his sheep receive rest. And so it says in verse 2 that he takes them to lie down in green pastures and, and leads them beside still waters. Uh, In Israel, sheep would have needed places to to rest during the the awful heat of the day. And so the word pasture there has the picture of of an oasis, a place where the sheep could go and there'd be grass to lie down on and there'd be uh, shade for them. 
uh, sheep needed still waters because they're skittish. Uh, and if you uh, take a sheep and, and, and try to get them to drink out of a, a fast flowing stream, they become too scared and they'll run away rather than quench their thirst. And so it was the responsibility of the shepherd to find those areas of pasture and oasis and, and, and slow flowing water for the sheep. This was hard work in Israel. It required times where, where they would spend days traveling from place to place, trying to find exactly the kind of, of pasture and water that the sheep were going to need. And that was the responsibility that he had. Philip Keller, some of you have read uh, his commentary on Psalm 23. He was a shepherd who became a pastor. Uh, and he said from his shepherding experience that there are four things that are required for sheep to be able to rest. Uh, first of all, they must have no fear. If there's wild animals around, they're not going to lie down and rest. Uh, interesting, they have to have no friction. If there's friction in the flock between sheep, they won't lie down and rest. The friction has to be dealt with in some way. They also have to have no flies. They, they, they don't lie down when they're being uh, harassed and bothered by by insects. And then finally, no famine. They have to be full. They have to feel like they have eaten. And it was the shepherd's responsibility to see that all of these things were provided for the sheep so that they could find the rest that they know. God knows your weaknesses. He knows the things that are going on in your life. He understands far better than you do the problems and distractions and the issues that, that come up in life that just make it difficult to find rest. And he is the one who comes alongside. Notice it says uh, in, uh, uh, in verse 2 that it is the shepherd who leads me besides still waters. God goes before his sheep. Cattlemen drive their cattle. Shepherds lead their sheep and leads them to find what they need. And the sheep trust the shepherd, and so they follow him. And they, they follow him and trust that he's leading them where they need to go. There are very few of us that don't feel like life has gotten overly hectic. Few of us who look at our life and say, yeah, I, I think I need more. I, I need to do more. I need more more hectic things in my schedule. We feel overwhelmed at times. There is a shepherd who promises rest. There is the rest that he provides in your salvation. That there's no reason to continue trying to, to do the work of salvation because he's already done it all. And he gives us rest from our labors in him. There's a shepherd who comes alongside of a sheep in the midst of of the hurry and hecticness of life when we feel overwhelmed. And if we will take advantage of him, we'll give to us wisdom and rest in the midst of all that life is throwing to us so that we can live our daily life under the care of the shepherd. But number two, the shepherd was not only responsible to give rest to the sheep, but notice in verse three, he was responsible to give restoration. It, it says there, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Practice of restoration would, uh, would involve at least a couple of things. One is the sheep that goes and wanders off. And you remember the, the parable that Jesus gave in, uh, in the Gospels of the, the good shepherd is the one who leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one and then brings them back to the flock. The other way in which a shepherd uh, would need to restore is related to that, and that is the cast sheep. The sheep likely who has wandered off and fallen down. Uh, the way the body mass of a lamb or a sheep is, is if they fell and rolled onto their back, they are helpless. They, they're unable to move and, and to get back on their feet. And so I, 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 you know, I don't want to be... Uh, too cliche about this, but you, you can imagine the lamb on his back and the little paws up in the air trying to, trying to get over and roll himself over. 
And the more he does it, the worse it becomes. And the result of a cast sheep is that gases form in the body, they lose all power in their legs, and they eventually die within a period of, of, of hours. And if the shepherd has not noticed they're missing, they have no way of correcting themselves, no way of restoring themselves. The shepherd is the one who restores. That, that word has the idea of to recover, uh, to return. Uh, it's used sometimes in the context of, of repentance, to, to turn around. The shepherd's responsibility was to see that he knew where his sheep were, that he was able to come and, and provide for his sheep in their times of danger. And he was the one who went out and found the cast sheep and brought them back to himself. Isaiah takes this picture and, and applies it to us. In Isaiah 53, in verse 6, he says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We are by nature wandering sheep. We are by nature those that turn away from God and, and seek our own way. And like cast sheep, the longer we stay away, the more we try to do it in our own power, the more we try to take care of problems in our own strength, the greater trouble that we get into. Eternal trouble if we don't trust the shepherd. Our good shepherd came in order to recover us. He came to live the perfect life and to die to pay for the penalty of his people's sins and to rise from the dead to give to us new life. That's the hope we have as wandering sheep. That's the hope we have of a good shepherd. And when we receive Christ by faith, faith being we give up, trying to do things our own way and receive what he has already done, we receive that recovery. We receive that, uh, that change that brings us back to God and gives to us those great blessings. And he does this, notice in verse 3. Why does he do it? He does it at the end of verse 3, for his name's sake. Why does God bother with wandering sheep why does he take the time when we wander away over and over again? Because he's determined to bring glory to himself through his work of grace and mercy and salvation. It's all his work, and so he receives all the glory for what he has done. And because it's all his work, we can rejoice with great joy because we know it will never be changed. When he recovers us, we will never be lost. Jesus in John 10 said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Praise the Lord for a shepherd who went out and found us, who brought us back and gave to us the, the blessings of salvation and who promises, I'm never going to let you go. There will never be someone who can snatch you away, not even yourself if you belong to me, because I brought you back to God and I will keep you and will hold on to you to the end. He's not only a God, a shepherd who provides rest and restoration. Notice there in verse 4, he also is a God who provides refuge. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. One of the great responsibilities of a shepherd in Israel was to protect the sheep from wild animals. Uh, we know that the land was... Uh, had uh, wild animals who would come and, and take those wandering sheep uh, and take them away uh, to consume them. Uh, and it was the, the shepherd's responsibility to, she, to see that the sheep were protected. Uh, and so in John 10, when Jesus is talking about the difference between the shepherd and the hired hand, he says, well, the hired hand sees the, the lion coming and says, well, I'm not going to deal with this. They're not my sheep. And he takes off running. The shepherd is the one who goes after the lion, 
who defends his sheep from the lion because they're his sheep. And he recognizes that that's his responsibility. And the sheep are able to find refuge in a shepherd who will care for them. Remember, they have no means of defense. A sheep can't stop anything from coming and and taking it and destroying it. The only hope they have is in a good and faithful shepherd. And the tools of the shepherd are what give them their hope and their comfort. Notice he talks about a rod and a staff. So the rod was a short club that the shepherd carried with him. And that's what he used to beat off the wild animals. This is what David would have had when in 1 Samuel it says that uh, he killed a lion and he killed a bear as a teenager because he was protecting the sheep from the wild animal. The rod was a source of comfort for the sheep. The staff was also a a, a matter of comfort. It was a a longer stick that would be used to to guide the sheep. Sometimes the shepherd would come alongside and kind of hit hit the sheep a little gently on the side. No, no, let's get back in line. Let's get back with the flock. But it was a source of comfort for the sheep because they knew the shepherd was with them. The shepherd was watching over and caring for them. We have a shepherd who not only has defeated our greatest foe in Satan, but who guides us and who is encouraging and with us through all the steps we take in this life. And so it has great meaning there in verse 4 when it talks about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes the paths of righteousness, sometimes the paths that God himself establishes for us, takes us into the valley of the shadow, takes us into those dark places where everything seems to be dark and the light is fading quickly away and we don't know what's coming next and it seems oppressive even at times. And God says, but you're never there alone. When you're walking through the valley of darkness, I am walking with you and I am present with you. Sometimes that valley of darkness can be the hardships that we face in life. The things that we wish we could tell God, never again, we don't want these and we want to be done with them. But the shepherd leads us down those paths because these are the very means for our growth. The very means for us to learn what dependency really looks like. Those are the kinds of situations we we face when we're going through uh, pain, trials, family and discouraging times, when, when we're without jobs and we can't find employment. Those are the, the, the shadowy times in life that God says, I am there, and with my rod and my staff, I'm there to comfort you. The most significant, of course, is what the verse particularly has in mind as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This shadow is not only the severe trials we face before death, but can be death itself. For the believer, death is not something that we live in constant dread and fear of because we know Christ has already conquered death, and he conquered it for us. And death for us is entrance into glory. That doesn't mean the unknown doesn't produce some some fear, some questions. We have a shepherd who's there with us, as we're going through those times. We have a shepherd when we're down in the very depths of darkness before we go to see the glory and light of Christ who will be present with you and will sustain you and will give you all that you need in those times. You may be going through a dark valley right now. There may not be many people here that know the kind of valley that you're enduring, but remember that you do not endure it alone. The Lord is present with you as you go through that valley. Finally, our text says that the good shepherd is the one who gives refreshment to his people. Verse 5 seems to be a radical shift in the psalm. It goes from the Lord being our shepherd to the Lord being our host. And it's a picture of a great feast 
that takes place. Now, now there's some commentators that think, no, this is continuing to be the analogy of the shepherd and the sheep. I have some, some sympathy for that, but, but I still think that it's probably uh, the picture of a, of a great feast uh, that God has prepared uh, for his people. You notice he, he uses the, the imagery of uh, uh, there's, there's a cup, uh, there is oil for the head, uh, the cup is overflowing. There's everything that one would want uh, for a feast. And it's the Lord who's providing all of these things for his people. We're reminded in the book of Revelation, Revelation 19, that there's a great feast that's going to take place at the end of time for the flock of Jesus Christ. It's called the, the <clears throat> excuse me, it's called, it's coming. <clears throat> It's called the marriage feast of the Lamb. Uh, and it is the, the victory dinner that we have with Jesus Christ as Satan is defeated, cast into hell, and, and all that it needs to be undone is undone. And it's the celebration that glory and eternity has begun. And that is the feast that awaits us as God's people as we look forward to the culmination of, of our salvation, the culmination of of everything that God has in store for us. But, but I want you to look at this in the context of the psalm. We've just discussed in verse 4, going through the valley of the shadow of death, the trials and the sufferings of life. For God's people, celebration doesn't occur just when it's all over. We don't rejoice when it's all finally done, but we rejoice as believers even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death because we know we belong to the good shepherd, that he is guiding us. He's accomplishing his purpose. Great praise ought to be given to God. I know this is hard, but great praise ought to be given to God in the midst of the trial not just after the trial is over, because we're rejoicing that he is our shepherd, he is providing for our needs, and we are able to have great hope and encouragement and perseverance because of him and all that he gives us. And then I'll just briefly note in verse 6, God promises that all of these blessings, these four R's, are all ours for all eternity. And the basis of that is God's abundant covenant love. In verse 6, surely goodness and mercy. The word mercy there in the Hebrew is the word for God's faithful covenant love to his people. Because of his deep love for his sheep, he will provide these things for us now and in all eternity. Because that's what the good shepherd does and the way he cares for his sheep. I have uh, never been a, a physical shepherd of physical sheep. I have to admit, I've never had a great desire to do that either. Um, but Donna's grandfather raised sheep. And he, uh, he raised them uh, over in Ripon and had a, a pasture area for the sheep. And Donna uh, has told me that... Uh, her grandfather loved his sheep, named them uh, one by one, which was probably his mistake because he could never eat any of his sheep. Uh, because I mean, one, once, you, once you name a sheep, how are you going to uh, kill it and eat it for Easter, Easter dinner? He would sell the sheep, but he wouldn't himself partake. But he had this deep affection for the sheep. That is a small representation of your shepherd's love and commitment to you. He has loved his sheep from all eternity. And he came as a shepherd to provide for his sheep that which we could never provide for ourselves in his determination to save us. Now, I think there's some significant misunderstanding about what it means that the Lord is our shepherd. And there are people that believe this applies to me, and it doesn't. Not everyone has the Lord as their shepherd. 
Jesus defines who his sheep are. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Do you see that? Two things Jesus says are the signs that he is your shepherd. Number one, you're listening to his word. The sheep hear the voice of their shepherd. They listen to their voice. And number two, they then do what he says. They follow in obedience. Only sheep have the privilege of being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, our obedience isn't what brings us into that relationship. What brings us in is faith. But the evidence that we belong to the Good Shepherd is that we live a life of listening to him speak through his word and doing, by the grace of God, that which he commands us to do in that word. And that shows that we are his sheep and following after him. And then the blessings that we've talked about this morning all belong to us. The, the rest, the restoration, the refuge, uh, the, excuse me, uh, the refreshment, all these things are ours because Christ has already earned them and given them to us. This week, no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, no matter what your fears are, your shepherd will be with you. He will be there present with you, and he will be there to provide everything that you need in the midst of all that you're going through. You're never alone because the good shepherd is your shepherd as you trust yourself to Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we have uh, looked and studied uh, the lessons that David learned because you were his shepherd, we thank you that we are able to have great hope because we have Jesus as our shepherd. Father, keep us mindful of all that you do for us in Christ. Grant to us that grace that we need to learn to trust you and to be dependent on you, to repent of our arrogance, to repent of our thinking that we can do things our own way and learn to follow you and learn to trust you. Grant these graces, we pray now in Christ's name. Amen.